Good evening. I'm Rosemary Pena, president of the Black German Heritage and Research Association and adjunct professor of German studies at UBC Vancouver. Our conversation this evening is in our new Black Germany and Beyond events series. Dr. Emily Frazier Rath and I are thrilled to welcome our featured guests, Diane Borche Liam, Dr. Corey Graves, and our inimitable discussant, Dr. Silke Hakenisch. This evening is one very close, this evening's conversation is one very close to my heart and has been such a long time in coming. I'm therefore especially grateful to Deanne for sharing her award win winning film with us and our audience. If you haven't had a chance to view it yet, you'll want to hurry. However, the film will also have its PBS broadcast premiere on America Reframed on May 19th and will stream on the World Channel for 30 days after that. Perhaps Deanne will allow us until tomorrow and we can all rewatch or watch it again tonight. I know I'd love to. So to get this party started, I'll ask Emily to please share a little about our work together and then turn the virtual microphone over to Silke Hakenish who will guide us through this important conversation. Emily. Thank you, Rosemary. My name is Emily Fraser Rath, and I'm a visiting assistant professor of German studies at Davidson College, a small liberal arts institution located just north of Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm also the executive director of the BGHRA. We are so excited to be able to invite Deanne Borche Liam, Dr. Corey Graves, and Dr. Silke Hakanesh to Davidson Col College and to the BGHRA today. Today is March 14th, 2022, and we, Dr. Pena, me, and most importantly, our incredible Davidson students are in our eighth week together. This semester, Dr. Pena and I are so pleased to have another opportunity to work with Davidson students as we co-teach our second course together. German 351, or Race, Gender, Migration, asks us to employ a critical lens informed by Black German studies to questions of migration, belonging, and identity, as these, these big human topics intersect with Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, with the German-speaking world, and with the lives and experiences of the global Black German community. This class, like its predecessor last semester, consists of three parts. It's, a, it's first an exploration of the aforementioned themes as they are, or could be, handled in the field of Black German studies. Second, it is a community-based learning course as we support the BGHRA through our work and will feature our final projects in the BGHRA archive. And third, it is most importantly an opportunity for students and through these recordings, our broader BGHRA and Davidson communities to speak with people whose lives and work intersect with, influence, shape, and inform Black German studies. This series would not be possible without the generous support of the Dean Rusk International Studies Program Speaker Fund here at Davidson and the interim director of the Dean Rusk Program, Dr. Verna Case, as well as its program administrator, Meg Zweif uh, Mel Zweifel. I also I cannot ever thank Meg Sawicki, our German Studies Department Administrator, enough for her support, encouragement, and organization that truly has kept us going and remains a vital part of what we are doing. So to Meg, Mel, and to Verna, thank you. Before Dr. Pena and I turn things over to our uh, guests today, I'll take a moment to uh, introduce Dr. Silke Hakanish, who will then in, uh, introduce both Deanne and Corey. Dr. Silke Hakanish is an associate professor at the Institute of North American History at the University of Cologne. She specializes in 20th century childhood and adoption studies, African American history, uh, commodity history, and Black diaspora studies. Silke is the author of Chocolate and Blackness, A Cultural History, out in 2017. She has published articles in Historische Anthropologie, Food and History, and Comparative Zeitschrift für globale Geschichte und uh, Vergleichende Gesellschaftsforschung. She has written chapters for Rethinking Black German Studies, Kinder des Zweiten Weltkrieges, 
and Race and Sex and a Geschichte der Neuzeit, as well as recently a chapter on Sojourner Truth for the volume Geschichte des politischen Denkens uh, des 19. Jahrhundert. So currently, she is working on a manuscript titled Colorblind Love or Racial Responsibility, the Adoption of Black Ger German Children to Postwar America, which analyzes the contested debates the transnational adoption of Black German children elicited in the African and Af uh, African American and American more generally community from civil rights organizations to social work professionals and individual adoption advocates. Her forthcoming publications include the edited volume Adoption Across Race and Nations, U.S. History and Legacies with Ohio State University Press, as well as book chapters on the contested practice of proxy adoptions, transnational debates on family, race, and civil rights, as well as chapters on the construction of German shepherds as police dogs and the history of racialized advertising. Silke serves as a board member for the book series Imagining Black Europe at Peter Long Publishing as it, and is an advisory me board member for the Black German Heritage and Research Association. Her research has been supported by the German Academic Exchange Service with Ade Ade, the uh, Thyssen uh, Foundation, the German Research Foundation, the Society for the History of Children and Youth, the Alliance for the Study of Adoption and Culture, the University of Cologne, and the German Historical Institute in Washington, DC. Her work has also been featured in the New York Times, on Deutschlandfunk, and in blogs and podcasts. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Dr. Silke Hockenmesh and our distinguished guests. Thank you so much, um, Emily, and uh, good evening, um, uh, everybody, uh, or at least it's uh, in the evening in my neck of um, the woods. It's, it's truly a great pleasure and really an honor to be in conversation with the two incredible women uh, who are here um, tonight, Diane Borshalim and Corey Graves. I have um, followed their work for more than a decade now, and I'm truly honored and just thrilled and happy to be here tonight and to be able to facilitate this conversation. Now, um, please let me introduce the two guests um, to you. Corey Graves is an associate professor of history at uh, the University at Albany, State University, New York. <clears throat> she got her PhD from the University of Mis uh, Wisconsin, Madison, and a master's degree from the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. Um, her research interests are really um, uh, broad, but mainly uh, she focuses on representations of gender, race, um, nation, and the family. And this um, is also reflected in her latest book, which has come out um, last year. Oh, you can't really see it, so here. I hope it works. It doesn't really, sorry. Um, oh yeah, here. Sorry about that. The war bone um, uh, family, African-American adoptions in the wake of the Korean War. I will talk a bit more about the book um, in a moment. So she is really interested how African-Americans specifically and Americans more broadly made sense of uh, normative notions of marriage, the nuclear family, gender roles, gendered roles, expectations, um, and so on. Her other major research, um, and I think this is going to be her um, next book, is on the history of beauty politics, and especially racialized notions of beauty, and how a beauty industry developed um, specifically targeted towards African American um, women. Um, uh, Kauri has won awards for teaching um, um, excellence and um, uh, when you've seen her alive at conferences or in the classroom, you can tell that she is really a committed um, teacher and she makes special efforts to um, recruit um, students from historically underrepresented um, populations and uh, serves as a counselor for said student body at her um, university. <clears throat> 
Now, please let me turn to um, uh, the other guest of um, tonight, Diane uh, Borche Lim. So again, welcome and thank you so much for allowing us to pre-watch uh, your latest um, documentary. And I hope that many of you got a chance to watch it on uh, Vimeo. Um, so Diane has more than 20 years of experience uh, working in development, production, and distribution of independent documentaries. Um, she's the producer, um, director, and writer of a documentary um, that has been um, uh, nominated for an Emmy Award, um, First Person uh, Plural, which came out in 2000. And also um, she has produced and directed the award-winning films in the matter of Cha Zhonghi, 2010, and Memory of Forgotten War in 2015. And um, I can only recommend um, watching um, uh, these documentaries. Um, of course, for those interested in um, um, transnational, transracial adoption, the history of this practice, um, but um, really, uh, I think she has gained a reputation for the way she um, chose to represent the adoptees who share their stories and also for telling her own experience. She was the former director of the Center for Asian American Media, where she supervised the development, the distribution and broadcast of new films for public um, television. Diane has also worked with Congress to support minority representation in public um, media. She is also a former um, fellow from the Sundance, Sundance excuse me, Institute. And um, she is um, the um, head, I guess, I think, um, of Moo Films, a nonprofit um, a documentary production company based in Berkeley, um, California. And it's um, a mission of Moo Films to uh, produce and distribute documentaries and educational media about. Um, social justice um, uh, issues, um, cultural issues, questions of um, uh, racial formation, ethnic um, identities, and their representation in mainstream um, um, American media. And she is committed to promote cultural um, understanding and also a more accurate media representations. <clears throat> And um, uh, some of you have just um, seen her latest documentary, Geographies of Kinship. And while we speak, she is already developing um, uh, uh, different new projects. Um, and maybe you want to share something about them later on, um, Relative Strangers and Crossings. So again, thank you both so much for being here with us um, um, tonight. I would, um, for those of you who are not familiar with um, Corey's latest book, The Warborn Family, I would briefly like to introduce um, um, this book and um, um, the, the findings that Corey is presenting here um, to you, and then try to draw out some connections between her book, Deanne's um, uh, work, um, her film, and also larger connections between the Korean, but also the German context when we take a look at the history of transnational um, adoption. So in her book, Kari Graves um, sheds light on a um, really a rather unexamined chapter uh, in the history and historiography of international adoption, namely the role that Black American families, African American couples played um, in the early years of transnational adoption. So she specifically takes a look at um, Black American members um, of the military services who went to Korea um, and she analyzes their experiences there, um, um, 
the extent of poverty that caught many of them by surprise, um, the exposure to war orphans and um, this immediate sort of child-centered humanitarianism that others have written about um, um, as well, and how this was um, closely followed and commented on in the Black press um, back um, home. Um, she connects this um, discussion with, with what's happening, with what's happening in Korea, with the situation um, of Black American couples who were interested in adoption in the United States, and thereby draws a connection between questions of transnational adoption with discriminatory practices um, uh, on the domestic adoption market, so to speak. Many um, Black American families do to specific experiences were wary of um, um, social welfare um, uh, agencies, and many agencies had requirements and standards um, that were extremely different, uh, difficult for um, African Americans to meet in terms of housing, in terms of income, um, um, and so on. So, uh, these forces combined, um, uh, so to speak, led Black American couples to consider adoption of um, a Korean child, and especially so um, a child of um, what was then considered um, a mixed race. Um, so children that were seen as half American, half Korean, or um, um, half Black American, um, half Korean. Um, many of these early adopters were um, Black military families, um, um, and these children were brought to the United States via proxy adoption in many cases, a contested um, practice that is also referred to in the documentary um, by uh, Diane when she talks to one of the children of Harry Holt, who initiated the broader um, adoption of Korean children to the United States. <clears throat> and um, I think what Kari Graves skillfully does in her monograph is um, albeit um, the actual numbers were um, not extensive, the numbers um, uh, to which um, Black American families um, adopted Korean children. It is, however, significant because it alters our understanding of this uh, rescue narrative that is often referred to white Americans. Um, um, and here we see the motives are also um, a bit different because they are um, in a Strictly linked to questions of full citizenship, civil rights, um, discrimination they experience um, uh, at home, and so on. And I think if you rewatch uh, Deanne's uh, film and also follow Corey's work, you'll see so many connections um, to be made between um, these two. <clears throat> And in general, I think um, it is really fruitful to compare Korea and Germany um, here, especially when we look at the early years of transnational adoption, the mid 1940s to the mid 1950s. And um, adoptions from Korea have figured quite prominently in the historiography of international adoption, which is no surprise um, uh, because of the sheer numbers and the extent um, and the structures that were implemented. But I, I think it is worth noting that the first um, uh, organized adoption efforts um, happened previously uh, from the late 1940s, early 1950s on um, with the um, uh, uh, Black German children who were adopted largely by African-American families um, uh, to the United States. So here again, we have children who are adopted primarily on the basis of race in the wake of a totalitarian um, uh, regime um, uh, in Germany. Uh, as in Korea, the German children were considered 
illegitimate. Um, uh, their mothers were unmarried. Their fathers were seen as part of the occupational force. So these women wore the stigma of being labeled um, a prostitute, of uh, they were stigmatized for fraternizing uh, with the uh, military service um, uh, members. And these children were of dual heritage in countries that perceived um, themselves to be racially homogeneous, or at least that were committed to this fantasy of racial uh, purity. And in both cases, uh, in both countries, we can see that these children visibly disrupt um, um, this um, notion. Um, Two other similarities that we see here is that the press is a mobilizing factor in both cases. Um, Christian media outlets and the popular um, uh, press for the Korean children. And um, I think specifically uh, the black American press um, uh, in the case of the children who were considered half black from Korea and um, uh, Germany. And um, adoptions from both countries also elicited criticism from the International Social Service, um, um, the Child Welfare League, because of um, this practice of proxy adoptions and um, um, welfare, um, uh, social workers, child welfare officials felt that this was a process that lacked um, sufficient supervision. So many um, similarities um, that we do see here and a more um, immediate connection maybe is also that many um, members of the US military who served in uh, uh, Korea uh, started their tour of duty in Germany. Um, and here in Germany, it was common practice if um, an African-American soldier had a relationship with a white German uh, uh, women, woman and um, uh, sought a marriage approval, for instance, or if um, army officials knew of a child to be born, quite often these military service members were then transferred um, to Korea because the army had no interest in what was then considered love across the color line. Um, and so I, I assume, I think that we still lack evidence um, of this because um, there hasn't been much work done yet, but I assume that we have, and I'm taking up uh, Deanne's title of the documentary, Geographies of Kinship. I assume that there might be siblings in uh, Germany and Korea fathered by soldiers who had been stationed in Germany and then been transferred um, um, uh, to Korea. So I think there's still a lot to be uncovered um, here, a lot to be um, discussed. So now I would be, um, I would like to hand it over to you, Deanne, um, and ask you to um, talk a little bit about uh, your documentary, uh, maybe share with us um, um, a snippet, a clip over the film, and also how you um, reached out to the adoptees um, that you present in, um, in your documentary. And maybe um, later on, we could talk a little bit about the experience of Estelle, um, because I think uh, her case beautifully connects your documentary with uh, Corey's research. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, first, thank you, um, Rosemary and Emily and uh, for inviting us here. I think um, it's such an honor to be here with you all. Um, I know that this is something we've been trying to do for a while and I'm, I'm finally, I'm glad that we, we've finally been able to come together to look at these um, interconnections. Um, so uh, I, um, so Geographies of Kinship is actually my third film about transnational adoptions from Korea. Uh, as Silke said, uh, I've made two prior films, both that were um, personal, um, that spoke to my personal experience as a Korean adoptee. I was adopted in 1966 by a white American family and grew up in California. And so the first film, First Person Plural, uh, chron chronicles my journey to um, 
to locate my original family in Korea. And um, eventually I do find them and um, travel to Korea with my uh, two adoptive parents. And um, that, that meeting of the two families um, is kind of a core um, element of that first film. Um, and then the second film called is called In the Matter of Cha Jung Hee. And in that film, I look for the girl that I was switched with because when I was adopted, I actually arrived under the identity of a different girl. My, my parents adopted a girl named Cha Jung Hee and it turns out that I wasn't her, but I arrived in the US with all her documentation. And so uh, In the Matter of Cha Jung Hee is my attempt to sort of set the record straight and to explore who, who this um, other person was. Um, and explore the lives of um, uh, women of my age in Korea, named Cha Jung Hee. Um, so when I was, both of these films enabled um, me to travel around the country and around the world and meet um, so many Korean adoptees from many, many different places. Um, you know, as you saw in the film, there are about 200,000 Korean children that were adopted um, around the world, majority to the US, but also to Europe. Canada and Australia. And um, so, you know, I met Korean adoptees from Italy, from Sweden, um, the Netherlands, um, Switzerland, uh, and, um, you know, small towns throughout the United States. Uh, and I started to really wonder how was it possible that so many um, Korean children ended up dispersed, you know, in primarily white families throughout the world. And um, so I, I wanted to really delve into um, to look at the political, social, economic forces that um, that enabled so many children to be sent overseas. At the same time, I wanted to um, I came to realize in the making of my film and my, both of my personal films and doing research about this history that there are a lot of um, mis not so much. Well, I guess misconceptions or myths um, about uh, Korean adoption. Um, and I, I wanted to really try to have an opportunity to um, look at those, those kind of um, myths and try to dispel some of them um, while also writing or weaving into um, broader Korean and American history, the story of the missing story of Korean adoptees and their families. And so um, one of the, I think, myths of Korean adoption is that, um, that we're all Korean war orphans and that we're all actually orphans, uh, meaning orphans in, in the sense of having lost both sets of parents and having no biological family in the world. Um, and um, that's actually, um, it turns out that that's not true. A majority of the children adopted from Korea did have families. Um, it could have been a single parent, single mother, single father, a grandparent. Um, it could have been an, um, an intact family with many siblings. Um, in, my, in my case, I was um, one of five children and um, of an intact family. And yet I entered the adoption system um, as a child with a family and then came out of the adoption system as a quote orphan with no family. And that was a legal process, even though it was based on a bunch of lies in the, <laughs> in the sequence of events that took place. Um, it was a legal process that um, ended up you know, in, in the situation of my adoption. And so, um, and I think there's also a common perception that um, Korean adoptees are all war orphans. The Korean War um, was fought during the, during between 1950 and 53. Um, and the majority of Korean children are not war orphans. And yet there's the common perception that we all came out of the war. And um, it turns out that uh, a majority of the 200,000 children that were adopted overseas, a majority were actually adopted in the 1970s and 80s during a time of rising wealth and you know, industrialization and urbanization of South Korea. Um, at a time when you would think that adoptions would decline or end, adoptions radically increased. And so I think that's, so when you look at the Korean adoptee community today, you'll see that um, you know, there's a lot of activity and um, exchange and um, adoptee associations and networks, and many of them are, are, are formed by adoptees adopted during the 70s and 80s. And then I think related to the Korean War, I mean, the Korean War was a devastating, um, incredibly violent war 
there were an estimated 4 million people who died, a million Chinese and 3 million Koreans. 3 million Koreans. And yet in the United States, it's, it's called the Forgotten War, um, which to me is just you know, uh, incomprehensible. Um, but I think in another kind of misperception or common perception of Korean children uh, adoptees is that um, if you are, that we were war orphans, but that we we're or war orphans because um, our parents ha had been killed as a result of the war, um, as a result of bombing or the fighting. Well, it turns out that, um, you know, that's only really scratching the surface, of course, um, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands children, of children uh, lost their families. Um, but I, in, in geographies of kinship, I really wanted to kind of reorient the origin story of Korean adoption to really look at what really happened during the war and what was the impact of um, the military presence of the UN forces, the US forces, and what were the mechanics of how children became orphans and then eventually were adopted. And um, so, you know, that's when I really discovered the connection with um, the children of Korean women and US um, soldiers or allied soldiers during and after the war and um, wanted to really chronicle that experience and, um, and delve deep, more deeply into that, that history. Um, and so if I, if I may, um, I think some of you have seen the film um, that uh, I think Rosemary sent the link to, but I thought I would show a short clip. It's about a seven minute clip from the film that um, gives a, a bit of background of this, this particular history tied to the Korean War. Um, so if I may, I'm gonna share the screen and um, try this out. So it's about seven minutes. So hang on. And you're gonna see my messy screen, but here we go. Okay. The Korean War left at least 3 million Koreans dead and thousands of children were orphaned. During and after the war, American soldiers were providing lots of resources and developing very benevolent relationships with uh, South Korean children. What's often not recognized is that the very first adoptions were by American soldiers. On the other hand, American soldiers were also fathering many children who were born to Korean women. Quite often, the American soldiers would uh, have a girlfriend and just keep her as long as she was there. And then, then sometimes he'd promise to marry her. Sometimes they just took off and went back and never even said when they were going. Oh, sometimes the mothers try to raise them, but it was so hard. There were many stories of children being found abandoned on the side of a street, you know, in the garbage, just being completely disposed of. And so many of those children ended up in hospitals or in orphanages. Well, the day that I met Sergeant Cook, I remember that day so vividly. It was a spring day, beautiful day. And this particular day was the first day I ever went upstairs to the auditorium. They had a lot of soldiers, and a gentleman asked me to come sit on his lap. He gave me a package of gum. He was really a very kind-hearted person. For whatever reason, that particular day, Sergeant Cook chose me. During the adoption process, I was allowed to go to the military installation and live there. 
wherever the U.S. military was, you see camp towns. Camp towns were these special entertainment districts, and they're only for the U.S. military. Prostitution was technically illegal, but widely available in the camp towns. The military prostitution that became the kind of signature activity of the camp towns was condoned and even regulated by the South Korean government in order to maintain good relations with the U.S. forces. Women had to survive, they had to eat. They often had to feed uh, children. They were often widows or they were daughters who had elderly parents or who had younger siblings that they had to take care of. And one way to do that was to do whatever was necessary. Cook, do the laundry, be a girlfriend. Can you imagine over 50 years ago what it was like for as an unwed, or even if she were married with a black child in Korea? The conventional wisdom at the time was that mixed-race children had no future in Korea. It was not only the fact that they were racially distinct, but that their mothers were presumed to be prostitutes or sex workers. Who knows what the circumstances were, but there's no doubt in my mind that my mother would have suffered tremendously. Some of the mothers had been raped and some of the mothers had been in consensual romantic relationships with foreign men, but they were all sort of assumed to be prostitutes. Korea has a family registry system, the Hojok system, and it requires that every person be part of a family. Household head must be a male, father, husband, or son. Without being on the Hojok, you basically have no legal existence. If you're the illegitimate offspring of a Korean woman, you have no place on the hojok. That means you can't go to school. You have no citizenship rights. As far as the law was concerned, they didn't exist. My father brought me into this country. I remember entering Union Station, and his wife and the four boys were there waiting for us. I couldn't speak English. I didn't understand English. They could not speak any Korean. I don't even think my father could speak Korean. I was behaving just like I had been in the orphanage, just going along with things. It was basically a life of servitude. Sweeping the floors, washing the dishes, helping my mother, doing a lot of chores. By the time I got to junior high school, I was ironing every weekend, washing the clothes, cooking all the meals. I didn't have people that I hung out with and all of that. That was not part of my life. I was very much agreeable. I had lived such a um, passive life where you just adapt to whatever. I never was in contact with any inner feelings one way or another. Okay. Um, well, I hope everybody was able to see that. Did that, did that come through? Okay. Okay. It's hard for me to tell sometimes with Zoom. Um, in any case, Estelle, um, I think Estelle's story um, is very, for me, very personally moving. Um, you know, she was part of the early generation of um, adopted children from Korea, adopted by an African-American soldier who was stationed there. 
um, who met her um, during one of um, his unit's visits to the St. Paul Orphanage um, in Seoul and this kind of random meeting. And she describes um, how he would come and visit uh, every now and then, and they developed this relationship. And he decided at some point that he would um, you know, adopt her. So he wrote his wife and um, the, what, you know, his wife never even met Estelle, but she agreed. And um, eventually he um, was able to arrange army transport for her um, and she arrived um, with him to the United States. Um, anyway, that's um, part of the story. I hope if you haven't seen the film, um, it will, I, I will make it available for another day or so so that um, wh whoever's registered can, can see it. Um, should I stop now and then? Um, yeah, thank you, Diane. Thank you for uh, sharing a clip of um, uh, of your documentary with us um, uh, again, and also in your comments before. Um, I think uh, really important, and the documentary also does that beautifully. Deconstruct some of the misperceptions that um, uh, a lot of people have of uh, Korean adoption, also because of media representation. Um, of what is sort of commonly uh, told. But I think what uh, started with Korea is something that we see in uh, happening in international adoption um, in many, many countries that um, sometimes prospective adoptive uh, parents think they adopt an orphan. Um, and in, in the majority of cases, um, uh, these children are not orphaned, but that orphan is a category that is intentionally produced um, um, to satisfy a certain demand. Um, I think that this is a practice that was established in this context, as you mentioned, uh, and a practice that continues to stay with us um, um, when we look at um, various other countries. Um, I have uh, tons of questions, uh, but we'll reserve them from, uh, for later and uh, would like to um, turn over to you, Kari, and, um, and see if you can draw some connections maybe between Estelle's um, story, mm -hmm. uh, her experiences, and your own research. Absolutely. And thank you so much. It is a true pleasure to join this conversation with scholars that I have admired also for years, uh, whose work has inspired the questions that motivated me to pursue this topic. And also for Rosemary and Emily, who have worked so uh, diligently and, and with such energy to make sure that we can have this kind of conversation. I will start by saying that my research project began with similar questions, questions about myths regarding adoption and specifically the myths surrounding African-Americans adoptions of children in the United States and also children in nations where African-American soldiers had been stationed. The project and I'm gonna just share my screen for a moment. And I know we have a couple of questions about um, sharing the visualizing the screen. So if people are having trouble, please do drop a note in the chat and we'll see if we can help you navigate some of the Zoom space so that you can see all of the content and speakers. But I just wanna share my screen for one moment to show a few of the images that drew me to this topic and helped me set up the questions that would lead to the book, A Warborn Family. So I'll just share very briefly. Again, I also have a very messy screen, so bear with me and uh, thank you for your patience. But I just wanna show you some of the images of these soldiers, of the children, and of the networks that became essential to the project of adopting children from not only the US, but also Korea, Germany, Japan, and later Vietnam. And I think Setka's question about these connections and these families really does give us a way of understanding that this adoption story was about networks and webs of connection. Many of these children, and I think Deanne will tell us more about her next work, that many of these children, yes, have half siblings 
in other nations. So the images that you see are part of the collection of images that I was able to sort of curate for the project. These are images from the African-American popular press and from the Pacific Stars and Stripes, the army newspaper for the US. And they are the images that really did sort of establish a popular narrative and a set of popular narratives and popular representations of African-Americans adopting children from around the world at the height of the Cold War and at the height of what we see as sort of the modern civil rights movement. You'll notice on the left, there's an image that a mother with her children from around the world is the African-American entertainer, Josephine Baker, an expatriate in France who adopted children from around the world whom she called her rainbow tribe. She's one of the more famous African-American adoptees, uh, adoptive parents in the story, and, but she is not sort of a central figure. Instead, I focused on men like the two that you see on the right hand of the screen. Men who were soldiers, who encountered children, who were identified, and I'm gonna stop sharing here, children who were identified as orphans in need of adoption, but as Deanne has said, children who often had parents, had at least one biological parent. So the questions I asked were, why did African-Americans participate in these waves of transnational adoption? As Silke has noted, Germany really was the first and major transnational adoption network, a series of networks that African-Americans played a vital role in. African-Americans would adopt thousands of children from Germany in response to both uh, the efforts of organizations like the NACP, but also largely in response to the efforts of adoption advocates like a woman named Mabel uh, Grammer, who was a journalist and worked with the Baltimore um, Afro-American. Through that newspaper, she was able to publicize the need for African-American adoptive families for children in Germany and also arrange adoptions. So the project for me was really a question about origins, but looking at a different kind of timeline for those origins. Many of the scholars who I am inspired by were thinking about Korea as sort of the beginnings of transracial adoption. But that construct was possible only because they were thinking about it from the perspective of white adoptive parents adopting children from Korea. For African Americans, Korea sort of represents the decline of their involvement in transnational adoption. So one of the questions that I asked was, why was this the case? Given that some of the racial policies that had limited um, the ability of African-Americans to adopt existed in that post-World War II era and continued into the post-Korean War era. And given that ideas about race continued to inform how social workers and child welfare communities imagined adoption. And by that, I mean most of the social workers and many of the parents themselves believe that children fathered by African-American soldiers should be adopted by African-American families. In fact, had to because of the race um, policies and social constructs in both the US and other nations. So how was it that given those sets of circumstances, how did the adoption numbers plummet in Korea? So for me, it was about reestablishing a different timeline of adoption and sort of building from Germany with a very brief sort of introduction that that was for African-Americans, the place where their transnational adoptions became most visible. But then in Korea, they're still participating, but their numbers decline. So my book tried to evaluate what led to that decline. And in many ways, it is directly related to ideas about the notion of colorblind love and the roles that white Americans, since white Americans adopted um, what Deanne was saying, over 200,000 children adopted between 1953 <clears throat> and 1988 from Korea. The majority, about 150,000 being adopted by families in the United States. So how do we sort of 
imagine those two timelines and what are the relationships. In my work, I concluded that a lot of the work that people were doing to try and advance narratives about civil rights and about African Americans and equality became sort of translated into narratives about colorblind love. And in that way, facilitated adoptions of white families of children from all over the world who were racially different from themselves, and in some ways displaced African Americans in that process. So my book attempts to evaluate questions that led me to those conclusions. But as I mentioned, I began with those images of those soldiers. And one of the things, other than the fact that soldiers were fathering children in Japan, Germany, throughout Europe where they were stationed, and then in Korea, and then Vietnam. That's one of the ways that we can sort of see connections in these stories. But the other real connection is that African Americans and interracial couples were also doing the work of adopting children from these nations too. So that uh, one of the images I showed of um, the uh, Mr. The, uh, soldier Sweeney and his new daughter, he and his wife had adopted children from Germany before they adopted children from Korea. And that's a characteristic that I picked up on in a number of adoption cases. When I first encountered uh, Deanne's latest, the work that you were able to preview tonight, I was also moved by Estelle Cook Sanson's story because it does in many ways um, highlight the human consequence of these types of adoptions that while the press in the United States and especially the black press attempted to make these adoption stories, stories that we would celebrate and stories that I and other scholars have described as kind of fairy tale in nature, that the children who were being displaced and then placed in homes with virtual strangers were the ones for whom this story of adoption has been explored but not fully because we need to be able to connect them to these histories and recognize that the cost on the one hand we think about cost in terms of policies and sort of the economics and there's amazing work on that but that the cost for each individual adoptee could be quite steep so Estelle's story of entering this family and finding herself in many ways feeling cut off from both her biological family and this new adoptive family is a characteristic that does connect, again, all of these adoption experiences also. So I have found in listening to adoptees from Germany, from Korea and Vietnam, this sense of both loss, but also a real sense of a yearning for answers to the questions that we are attempting to provide in this history, but I think that work like Deanne's uh, goes so much further in providing not only a historical context, but these touch points for adoptees to connect and to tell their stories in ways that allows them to see what are the continuities, what were the ruptures, and ultimately, what are some of the ways that we can begin the process of supporting um, healing for the kinds of trauma that very young people endured in these geopolitical negotiations that often were set up to resolve certain kinds of problems, but then created new problems through very um, purposeful, in some cases, denial of the reasons behind these kinds of adoptions. So that's how my work, I really see it sort of pulling at these threads that show a connection between these adoption waves um, that were a product of war. But as Deanne noted, the children who were then caught up in these waves of adoption uh, were often caught up for reasons that went well beyond the war. And we need to interrogate that, especially as we are in another moment where wars throughout the world are dislocating children and families. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Thank you so much for um, sharing with us um, how you came to your research project or how this project found you, uh, uh, the types of sources you were intrigued uh, by, 
and how you attempted also to critically intervene into the existing narrative, um, especially with regards to the role African-American families played here. And I think what's really interesting in um, uh, both uh, the documentary and, uh, and your book that uh, in both cases, we see um, that race is really the mobilizing factor. And um, on the one hand, because these children are racialized into being black. And in, on the other hand, because these children are racialized into being non-black. Um, so um, they are uh, what scholars like Kim Park Nelson, Eliana Kim, and others have argue, have described as this proximity to whiteness, um, uh, which made it easier for white Americans to embrace these children um, and still see uh, conceive of themselves as devoted to this colorblind um, um, notion or fantasy, um, um, maybe. Um, a question that I had, um, something that I'm um, also struggling with sometimes with, uh, with the sources that in, in, in Germany, there was a debate um, starting already in the late 40s that social um, welfare officials, uh, educators, and so on were cautious um, and did not support the idea of adoption and um, um, argued that it would be um, detrimental for the development of the children who um, grow up in a largely white environment and do not um, perceive of themselves as, um, as Black if they were then adopted into a Black American family and would live in a black community uh, not knowing the language um, um, being disconnected from their birth families um, and so on so this um, and this was also um, a position shared by uh, some members of the african-american civil rights leadership the naacp the national association for the advancement of colored people did not officially endorse these adoptions um, they argued these are the responsibilities of um, the, the german government or the korean government and, um, and they also were cautious that these children might face discrimination in Black communities because um, uh, in these communities, attention was also paid to color uh, or to racial differences. Um, now, I was wondering, um, did these kinds of debates also happen in Korea? or because of the magnitude of, of poverty and, and destitution, um, um, was this urgency to, to rescue, I guess, uh, much stronger? Any thoughts um, on this? Sure, I'll begin. The child welfare communities who were on the ground in Korea and also in the United States, sort of keeping track of what was happening as a result of the war, were equally cautious about transnational adoption. In fact, some of the first conversations from uh, people in organizations like the International Social Services in conversation with US-based child welfare agencies, agencies like the United States Children's Bureau, the Child Welfare League of America. In their letters, they say that adoption from Korea would be an unhealthy practice. They also believe that removing children from their birth country um, and placing them in a nation where there's cultural difference, language difference, and yes, racial difference would actually be more detrimental to the children. So that was an initial position. One of the ways that scholars have framed the transformation is that adoptions by these soldiers that we've talked about and by people affiliated with um, the Seventh-day Adventist who had a, a, a hospital and later an orphanage there in Korea, that the efforts to adopt and the ways that they established these um, 
networks pre-policy. So before there's policy to regulate adoption from Korea, people are finding ways to bring children to the United States. And so many scholars say that that was a part of the push that pushed child welfare communities and also pushed uh, the federal government to begin reevaluating the immigration restrictions and also the strategies that were used for transnational adoption. And that's why many people say Korea is kind of the origins of that because that's where you get these networks and these real policy driven um, regulations uh, to govern transnational adoption. So there is a transition and it takes place rather early. Uh, so in early 53, you have these conversations, but by 54 and 55, as the Korean war is raging, um, more children are being pulled out. And the popular press is also playing a role because they are highlighting the work that soldiers are doing and the work that um, nurses, a, a nurse is one of the first to adopt from the sanatorium that was sponsored by the Seventh-day Adventist. They are highlighting this work as a work that is about sort of these geopolitical concerns and it would become anti-racist work. And this is a part of the engine that's driving some of this development of transnational adoption in Korea. Um, Deanne, what, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's a really good um, good summary. I, 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 I mean, there were concerns um, and you know, I think that uh, in addition to what you're, you're saying that um, there were concerns among um, some of the Korean individuals involved in the early years that if South Korea could not absorb a few thousand mixed race children, you know, what kind of country is it? Um, and that to send these children out was, um, you know, it's just was not, was not something, it was not a foregone conclusion really that these children had to go overseas. I think that once you had this, um, you know, widespread press coverage of US servicemen adopting these children and how they were turning into these happy little American kids, you know, eating hot dogs and wearing cowboy hats. And there was so, and then once Harry Holt started to, you know, enter the picture and he got so much media coverage um, for adopting, um, you know, these children and then starting to bring these plane loads of children to the US um, that um, I think that those voices that had concerns initially uh, about sending children overseas, Korean children overseas um, and whether they would be able to adapt or you know, be accepted or whether they would face you know, discrimination, et cetera, all those concerns, you, you don't hear those voices um, at a certain point. I mean, there were efforts by various individuals to create opportunities for Korean mothers, for example, um, of mixed race children um, who um, were left you know, without the fathers to provide opportunities for those mothers to try to keep them or to, to incorporate uh, the mixed race children into the educational system. Um, but um, again, you know, adoption became such a major push um, and there was such a hunger for these children um, overseas in the US um, that it, it, those, yeah, those voices and those concerns really sort of disappeared. And also the economic incentive yes. that existed by the time we move from sort of into the post-war period, Deanne, where you talk about sort of picking up on the myth that these are war orphans, that a big part of the push is that these are families who are economically um, struggling and there is pressure. These institutions exist. They exist because of adoption and, and Western funds. So if you don't have adoptable children, the institution goes away. And this is a big part of um, the argument that Kimberly McKee makes in her work, Disrupting Kinship. And it's just a beautiful book that explores uh, sort of what she calls this adoption complex, that there is this economic incentive to keep children in the pipeline so that these institutions remain viable, but also so that uh, government responsibility for social welfare is lessened. And so attention to the needs of single mothers, attention to the needs of families who are in any way economically deprived or 
facing circumstances where there are questions about their ability to parent, that that feeds this system. So the economic piece, I think also silenced many voices who questioned uh, whether this policy and set of policies should continue. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much to both of you. And I am reminded of this. Um, I think in your documentary, Deanne, you call this this ethics of abandonment, mm -hmm. that certain structures were implemented quite rapidly that enforced um, um, adoption, even though, as you mentioned, it was not a foregone um, uh, conclusion um, to be handled this way, but that um, this was an option among other option is also completely erased in the ways we think of Korean adoptions now. Um, there is a question by Ruth um, Spencer and um, she wonders if um, uh, children with um, 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 African-American um, um, ancestry maybe had it easier because they were welcomed by the black community, whereas um, 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 full Korean um, uh, uh, children or um, half Korean children, those who were um, adopted by non-Asian families, um, uh, uh, white families, um, uh, maybe had less of a sense of um, um, communities um, and um, were deprived of um, contacts uh, with others like them. And um, maybe she's thinking of uh, day one in the documentary. Um, I think he describes quite vividly how he felt sort of unacknowledged with his Korean um, um, ancestry and then thereby sort of developed a second identity, a secret one from his adoptive parents where he sought out um, a Korean um, community. And um, um, she writes, many have ended up in mental health um, services um, because of the pain this might cause. Um, so this question is to both of you. Any, any thoughts, Diane, would you like to start maybe? Yeah, well, I mean, with, um, I guess, you know, by the time that day one was adopted, um, the, the, there was sort of an eventual decline of uh, the adoption of mixed race children from Korea and, and a transition to the adoption of full children, full Korean children um, from Korea. And, um, you know, I mean, typically they were adopted into white families and grew up very racially isolated. Uh, and um, there was actually a, a survey done a number of years ago by the Evan B. Donaldson Adoption Institute that surveyed the early generation of Korean adoptees about their identity. And, you know, I think it was over 78% um, who said that they um, grew up wanting to be white or thinking they were white. And um, so there was, you know, I think a, a lot of concern, you know, questions around racial identity um, and um, not having access to any kind of Korean community, Korean language or culture. And I think that in the case of Daewon in the film, who grew up in Switzerland, also very racially isolated, um, you know, I think he was adopted with his brother and um, you know, they had a really challenging time. And I think part of the way that he, Daywan himself survived was um, by actually seeking out as a youngster, the Korean community in Basel, Switzerland, and um, taking initiative to actually enroll in a Korean language class. Um, and I mean, he hid it from his Swiss parents, um, the whole fact that he was taking these classes and, you know, learning Korean. But I think that that um, connection really uh, helped him. In terms of the um, adoptees, so I'm working on a, a, a yet another film about Korean adoption. It's just never ending, this obsession with Korean adoption. Um, uh, anyway, that, that film is follows actually the first generation of um, mixed race Korean adoptees. And um, so they are the they are Estelle's generation, um, Korean adoptees who were adopted in the 50s, 60s, and one or two that were adopted in the 70s. Um, and they were adopted either by white families. If they were, um, you know, if their fathers were white Americans, 
um, they were adopted into white families. If their fathers were African Americans, they were adopted into African American families. And um, you know, of the like Estelle, um, I mean, I can't generalize at all. But um, of the of the interviews that I interviewed, I think um, like Estelle, of the um, those who were adopted into African American families, I think they really identified with the African American community and grew up in the African American experience. And um, there wasn't a lot of contact with Korean culture either. Uh, and mm -hmm. um, in fact, Estelle describes when she first started to reach out to the, to the Korean community um, as, an adult, as an adult, that she actually experienced discrimination from the Korean community because they did not believe that she was Korean. Um, so I think there were, there were a lot of complex um, ways in which race plays out in, in, um, in these experiences. And I'll add that one of the, we don't have enough to actually have a sense of what the experience was like for many Korean black children. We do know that yes, uh, for the families who, for Korean black children raised by African-American families or mixed race, and I, I keep emphasizing that so many of the adoptive couples that I encountered in the records were themselves mixed race. Um, so it's quite a, 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 a way of reimagining uh, identity and ideas about race and belonging. So for many people, I think that the, when I think about the kinds of myths that existed regarding African-American adoptees, one is, is that African-Americans embraced the mixed race children from many, um, episodes uh, of, of sort of war and occupation because they identified them as a part of the African-American diaspora, the African-American community. And one of the things that I saw in the records was that that was a process. It didn't happen immediately. That in fact, as Silka says that for African-American leading African-American civil rights organizations, they questioned uh, whether German black children were and should be raised in the United States by African-American families. So in some ways there is a, a question about how easily the children were embraced when we consider in the case of Korea, and I've heard from Korean black children, that their desire to know more about their Korean heritage didn't disappear. So even when they are in context in which their blackness is affirmed and recognized. Mm -hmm. It didn't erase the fact that they under, they, they many realized that that was only part of their identity. And so there are ways that uh, Estelle's story, when she talks about later in the film, she talks about still feeling isolated, even though she identifies with the African-American community and African-American experiences, that she still felt isolated. And that comes through in a few of the cases that I did access was that, yes, the black community, there seemed to be um, a greater degree of recognition of race, but not a full recognition of the dual heritage of the children they adopted. There were only a couple of cases, and there were a couple of outstanding cases where African American adoptive parents talked about their child's Korean heritage with them, attempted to learn Korean and adopt and incorporate Korean cultural um, markers and foods. But that's a rare experience. I read other cases where African American families said, we, the child has enough to deal with. We don't want them to also be burdened by this Korean identity. So I do think that there is a question still about sort of greater acceptance because from the perspective of a number of adoptees, and again, I, I had access to only a handful of the records, but for many of them, they described feeling the desire to connect with their Korean heritage and that that was denied to them even as they're sort of absorbed into blackness. Mm 
Thank you very much. There is another question um, in the chat, and I think um, um, this uh, also goes out to Diane and maybe allows you to um, talk about your um, your current uh, project. There's a question if these um, um, dual heritage adoptees were able to locate their biological birth um, um, parents. Um, um, and I think this is a, uh, also a part of your work. Um, um, <laughs> yes, uh, so this new project um, is, a I, 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 well, it actually follows a, a group of um, mixed Korean adoptees who go on a tour to Korea, and part of the tour includes uh, a search for their original families in Korea. And um, the group that I follow was um, started in 2017, and um, they're all in their 50s and 60s. And as Corey described, many of them um, did know that they were Korean, but really did not really pursue um, learning more about their Korean roots until much later in life. And um, so uh, interestingly, through DNA testing, many of the, um, so just in this little microcosm of like 20 people that I follow, a majority of, have, of them have found their, um, either their American birth fathers, families, um, or their Korean birth mothers' families, um, and sometimes both. Uh, and um, yeah, I can share a little clip of one story of a Korean adoptee who um, is part of this group, and she discovers, and she does, she discovers her biological mother. Uh, actually, she discovers that her Korean mother um, passed two years before this tour. And um, you know, it's very heartbroken to learn that her um, mother passed away without them reuniting. And um, she was also adopted by an African American soldier, soldier family, and um, with another uh, Korean adoptee. And um, during the tour, she took a DNA test with hopes that she might find her African American side. And um, for a long while, nothing happened. And then one day she got a phone call. So let me show you, <laughs> share you this little clip and then um, we can talk more about the connections. I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see. Okay. I got an email on my, on my phone and it said, um, it, it came from someone named Amanda Nguyen. And I know that Gwyn um, is a Vietnamese name. And so she said, I believe uh, my father just did his um, DNA. And I believe that my father is related to you. And I said, okay. Um, and I, I pulled over because this was crazy. And I pulled over and I said, I, I emailed her back and I said, listen, um, I see that your last name is Gwen. I said, I'm actually Korean and, um, I'm actually Korean and, um, my mother only had one child. So I'm, so thank you so much, but I don't think that your dad is related to me at all. She emails me and she said, he might be your brother. And I said, oh gosh, here, here's my phone number. Please call me. And so I'm walking into Target and she calls me immediately. And she said, um, yes, um, hello, I'm so sorry to bother you, but yes, um, I believe that he is, um, I believe that he is related to you. Come up number one on his DNA, uh, like maybe your half brother. And I said, I wanna tell you that my mother only had one child. I've gotten that very clear from my aunts and uncles, so I know. And I said, and besides, he's Vietnamese. Uh, I see that from your name. And she said, yes, we are. She said, but he's black and Vietnamese. And he was adopted. And I stopped in my tracks. And I said, okay, did you say he was black? 
That's her. So that, that's a little interview of um, Lisa Jackson. And um, so Lisa was born in 1962 in Korea and um, she discovers her brother, half brother um, from Vietnam who immigrated to the US um, after the passage of the Amerasian Homecoming Act by Reagan. Um, and what they learn in the process is that they have a half sibling, a sister who's black German. And um, their father was career military. And he actually was stationed first in Korea and then deployed to um, Germany and then went to Vietnam. And um, so I think, I mean, Soka, you were mentioning, you know, how sometimes um, soldiers who had relationships with German women and had children would then, you know, would go from Germany and be sent to Korea. Uh, and I think it's really interesting to look at kind of the concurrence of the different military conflicts that were happening um, around that time uh, and the deployment of US troops. So if you look at, for example, post-World post War II occupation of Japan, which was 1945 to 1952, um, the you know, uh, German occupation, occupation of Germany, um, 1945 to, what was it, 1955 or so. Um, and in the midst of that is the Korean War, which is 1950 to 1953. And the first soldiers to actually um, go to Korea, once the conflict started in, in June 1950, were uh, American troops that were based in Japan. Uh, and a majority of those were African American soldiers who ended up um, going to Pusan. And so there's this connection be between, um, I think, all of the, the movement of, of US military and a, a parallel between the transnational migration, the birth of these children, the migration of these children overseas via international adoption, and the, the deployment of troops around the globe. Um, but I think I would love to see <laughs> kind of more, I don't know, maybe there are some existing studies that I'm not aware of. And if they are, I would love for you to put them in the chat because um, I'm really interested in learning more. And, and if there isn't, you know, for people to actually look at this um, more closely, it's a fascinating, um, fascinating relationship. And I think as more DNA, you know, DNA testing is becoming more and more available and less expensive. And among the Korean adoptees of this little cohort that I've been following, um, it's been um, they have it's been easier for them to locate their American fathers than their Korean mothers because in Korea DNA testing is not as prevalent. Um, but when they do find their Korean mothers um, or Korean mothers' families, it turns out that um, they're mostly Korean women who had who might have relinquished a, a, you know, one of their children and then married another US serviceman and migrated over as a GI bride and then had children here. And it's the children who DNA test who are then you know, linking up with the Korean adoptees. Uh, and um, so I think that um, as, as DNA testing becomes more available around the globe that we may see you know, more connections between um, adoptees from these various countries. Yes, um, thank you. And I think as far as I can tell, DNA testing also isn't that prevalent here in, in Germany. But I think um, as um, 
knowledge about the availability, wide availability of these tests and the, uh, the potential it can uh, have um, is um, distributed more widely. And I think it is um, um, among the adoptee community. I'm sure there will be um, uh, many similar cases as the one that you just shared um, on um, adoptees, adult adoptees um, uh, learning about relatives in, in various countries, um, really. Rosemary, uh, hi. <laughs> uh, hi. Yes, it's that if time. If we have to stop. <laughs> yes, it's time to go. But thank you to our guests, Diane, Corey, and Silka for this powerful and engaging conversation. As always, many thanks to Emily and to Davidson College for making so many events like these possible for us. Today's recording will soon join our flourishing collection on YouTube, on our YouTube channel at Black Germans. Our 10th anniversary conference recordings are also now online. Subscribe and turn on the notifications so that you will be advised as new ones are added. Sign up for our newsletter at bghra.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Eventbrite for details about coming events. We hope that you've enjoyed our time together this evening as much as we have. And until the next opportunity, we thank you again for your time and attention. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.